Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Now I'm going to read the short poem by W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming. The poem, though it is short, uh, plays an important role in the career of this poet. And um, this is kind of a significant poem or a marker poem, uh, which shows uh, the abilities, the keywords, the ideas of the poet and his philosophy and understanding of the modern world. So um, even this poem is sometimes considered, for example, by David Harvey as the definition of the modernist condition or the modern times and how the world was changed. The poem has written almost immediately after the uh, First World War and it shows a, an apocalyptic version of the world. It mingles uh, the Christian ideas and mythology as well as the Greek and, uh, you know, uh, Attic tragedy and some, some types of Greek mythology to explain the modern condition of the, of the day. Uh, also, the critics of this poem believe that um, it somehow anticipates uh, the Second World War or the atomic bomb or the emergence of the Nazis in Germany. So uh, the, the poem uh, is a kind of visionary poem to use the terminology of W.B. Yeats uh, in which the poet, like a prophet, uh, knows, uh, as William Blake has said, knows about the past, the present, and what is to come or the future. Uh, the very term second coming is taken from Christian terminology. It is mm, part of the book of Revelation. Uh, and in that part, it is written that Jesus Christ would come back to the earth after 2000 years. And uh, W.B. has taken the title uh, from, from that part of the Bible, but he's not that much hopeful. In general, we can say that the uh, world at that time uh, was a world without God. So after everything happened in the 19th century, in the Victorian era, for example, and, uh, you know, the, the different, um, uh, let's say, antagonistic attitudes towards the church, the church no more played the role of the social unif unificatory factor or the social cement. And uh, therefore, there was nothing to which the people could cling as as uh, as their common belief, for example, or system of belief. So it was like a godless world, and the poets at the time tried to deal with this godless condition, and they were in search of some alternatives. Or some of them, like William Butler Yeats, uh, felt kind of lost in such a world. And uh, we, we, we can know that uh, from, in, from this poem that um, he sees uh, the Christian belief also meaningless. It is no more working. It is not even mythology. It is, it is a historical lie according to him. And, you know, now, now that we are aware, we know that we are nowhere, that uh, we, we cannot find ourselves and tone or in kind of uh, uh, agreement with the Christian belief. And there is one point I should emphasize before reading the poem that for WBA's history is not a linear history. History's movement, according to him, as a cyclical movement. And he introduces his vision of history as well in this form in practice. In a vision, he had introduced his idea of history, but in practice and in a kind of context, the poem shows Yeats's idea. Uh, the poem is consisting um, of two stanzas, uh, a shorter one and a longer one. The first one is a shorter one. Turning and turning in the lightning, Jaya, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. The word Jaya is taken from William Butler Yeats's book, A Vision. In, in that book, he's written that you have to pronounce it with, uh, with an emphasis of the word of the sound J. Uh, Jaya uh, and a vision is represented as a, a, as a version of two funnels, uh, the one in the other. And this is his image of history and passage of time. So I told you, for WBA's history is a cyclical kind of movement, or it is repetitive. And it is like that we start from here and then we move, move, move like the falcon. And then the falcon is here. The falcon, that's why the falcon cannot hear the falcon. This means that we have no control here. For example, the falcon is history and we are human beings. We are here. The falcon is there. So we cannot control history. So we are 
in a chaotic condition at the beginning of the 20th century. And this is uh, exemplified in this way by WBAs. And then when the Falcon comes across here, you should find the way uh, once again to this part of the, the other a funnel within this uh, this first funnel, and then the movement of history uh, would just reverse itself. So re history is happening or a re recurring phenomena, and uh, from point zero, we come across, for example, point one hundred, and then from point one hundred, we come back to point zero, and it repeats and repeats and repeats. So this is the story of the gyre, and it's image in uh, William Butler Yeats's A Vision. The book A Vision is kind of um, uh, William Butler Yeats's uh, Dictionary of Mythology. So uh, William Butler Yeats had kind of a private system of mythology represented in his poems and many of the symbols, the signs are explained in his book A Vision. So the falcon cannot hear the falconer in this way. So the lack of command or control of mankind and these two lines, um, I promise you, whenever you forgot what was modernism, just remember these two lines. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, near anarchy is loosed upon the world. So uh, this is the condition of, of modernism. It is like being forsaken and sea of chaos, isolation, despair. According to David Harvey, as he's quoting Friedrich Nietzsche uh, in his book, The Condition of Postmodernity, uh, Harvey's book. So, uh, so things are falling apart, uh, a sign of fragmentation, and fragmentation is one of the markers of the modern time, and the center cannot hold. You know, the modernists didn't uh, lose faith in the in the existence of a truth. They knew that the truth is not safely established or perpetuated. It is subject to change, but at least for a while in each, you know, in each part of, uh, part of their world they were living, they thought that, okay, there is a center, but the center cannot hold. So one of the major differences between modernists and postmodernists is apparent here that they that the, for for someone for modernists like WBA and his peers at the time the ones who shared the same historical context there was a center but that center was shaky mere anarchy is loosed upon the world most probably is a reference to what was up um, in 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 every part of the world due to the first world war the blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned the meaning is obvious the best lack all conviction and by conviction he means lacking conviction he means that they are indifferent so the best people in the world should should care about the things which are happening but they are careless they they prefer not to interfere and th this kind of lack of uh, lack of uh, interference or uh, lack of conviction is bothering to the poet. While the worst people like great dictators at the time are full of passionate intensity. They, they are negatively full of energy or, you know, full, they are full of bad energy and intensity we, we have we have to know is one of the words which repeats itself as a motif in wbh's poetry so what by intensity he highlights that 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 the negative passion such leaders of the world may have and here over this period they the first stanza of the poem ends and the longer stanza the second stanza begins and then uh, the the second stanza begins with some repetitions surely some revelation is at hand surely the second coming is at hand second coming with a capitalized s and a capitalized c is referring to that great biblical incident uh which at the book of revelation was promised the second coming Hardly are those without when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my my sight. Spiritus mundi, mundi means the world. The spiritus means spirit, so it means the world spirit. Sometimes it is also called the anima mundi. Mundi. It is like 
the, the collective unconscious of the mankind or the systems of archetype or the reporter of archetypes or the bank of memories. So um, this memory bank uh, is absent to us ordinary human beings, but a visionary figure or a seer, a prophet like W.B. Yeats is an heir of the romantics in believing himself as a poet prophet, especially um, he can be considered um, in line with William Blake and Percival Shelley. So in his, uh, he believes that there is a Spiritus Mundi, it is full of meanings, full of concepts, or full of types or archetypes which belong to all mankind, something like um, uh, Carl Gustav Jung also believed. And the, the, uh, the poet uh, provides the role of the intermediary, he is like the medium. And it, you know, the spirit of the world is in the air. The poet conjures the spirit to mankind via his symbol. So that the poet uh, sees something, uh, but he he translates them to us. So that the, he has access to the spiritual world. Um, and his two worlds, the spiritual world and physical world, are commingled while us, for example, living in, in the in the in the total physical objective world, the poet can have access to the spiritual part of this world uh, and it troubles his sight. So, you know, the second coming was supposed to be the coming of the savior, coming of the messiah. So it cannot trouble your sight. But with this word choice, WBA um, hints us, hints to us that, okay, this, this is not something positive to happen so it did, i see something that you cannot see that jesus christ is not supposed to come to save you so what he sees is, is something totally different somewhere in this it, this is his vision which has troubled his sight with its negativity somewhere in sands of the desert a shape with a of a lion body and the head of a man a shape with lion body and the head of a man is actually sphinx sphinx um was a character in the story of oedipus and uh, you know it was a woman with a uh, with the actually head of a the head of a woman and the body of a lioness uh, who posed oedipus to question an enigma that was a riddle and um, the people of Thebes could not answer that question in uh, based on uh, the storyline we see in Sophocles' play uh, Oedipus Rex. And Oedipus could answer the question. And here history is repeating itself. You remember that WBH had said that history, you know, turns to its original point and then repeats itself. So we are at this, we are somewhere where Oedipus was. Uh, we are encountering new animals. So, so not only maybe uh, Jesus Christ is not coming, uh, but also to, to provide us with uh, resolutions or answers, but also is coming this ugly creature uh, which had troubled the sight of the visionary poet here. A gaze blank, and this is what, how he depicts the creature, a gaze, a gaze blank and petalous as the sun, because the sun uh, doesn't care whether we like its head or not, you know, um, he just, or it just kind of shines. And here, he, he this thing, or so she is kind of petalous. And also, we have a literary device here, maybe used by WBS, and that's, that is a pun. Maybe uh, he's playing upon the, the two words sun and sun. And even the sun can be Apollo or that, that another indifferent God or the sun, Jesus Christ as well. So instead of that sun, the sun is coming, is moving slow thighs while all about it, real shadows of the indignant desert birds. So it, it is, you no. Know, if you remember photos or images of Jesus Christ, the bears are, the, the doves, for example, are just, um, you know, around him. But here the birds are indignant because of the presence of, uh, you know, Christ and Christ to be maybe. Uh, the new Christ, the, the, the darkness drops again. So the moment of uh, the vision of the poet has ended, the, he can no more see in, see the other world, the world of the spirits. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep, 20 centuries because in the book of Revelation was written that the course of history, uh, maybe 2000 years and then Jesus Christ was, would come back, we're vexed to nightmare and we're around 1920s. When the poem is written, so 
It was about 2,000 years from Jesus Christ's birth. The vexed the nightmare by a rocking cradle. So uh, a dream was promised, but the rocking cradle of the infant Jesus Christ has ended up ended up in such a thing. We 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 had left uh, we had lived uh, in the history with a lie, and now the poet is indignant. The poet is also lost because you know he, as the representative of mankind at the time uh, feels that uh, all this uh, b belief systems of humankind all what, what was promised by Christianity was a lie and it, it is all vexed to a nightmare and what rough beast is sour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So whatever it is, uh, we cannot expect Jesus Christ to come and save us. Um, it, it, the, the second coming would be the second coming of the Sphinx, not Christ. And anyway, it is happening in, uh, in Bethlehem. The, the birthplace of Jesus Christ. So uh, we can have expected a second coming, but we cannot expect the second coming of Jesus Christ, but a surrogate or a replacement for that figure. And history has repeated itself in that way. So instead of the second coming of Jesus Christ, we see the second coming of Sphinx and new questions posed to mankind. And here we are at the end of the poem. Of course, the poem ends with a kind of rhetorical question. Uh, the answer is whatever, you know, is not Jesus Christ or the Savior or the Messiah. And thank you very much for listening. And I hope you have enjoyed my explanations.